Hi there, I'm Abby. I'm with LDB Capital. We invest in people building businesses powered by visual technologies. We thrive on collaborating with deep technical teams at the earliest stages that leverage computer vision, machine learning, and artificial intelligence in order to analyze visual data. This is our series, The Women Leading Visual Tech. The purpose of the series is to highlight some of the top ladies whose work in visual technologies are revolutionizing business and society. We hope to build up a community of fantastic female entrepreneurs, investors, and technologists who are interested in helping each other succeed in the world of visual tech. In this interview, I had the pleasure of chatting with Dr. Kate Darling. She's an academic with a background in the legal and ethical implications of technology, and she's a researcher at MIT's Media Lab. She's a leading expert in robot ethics. Dr. Darling investigates social robotics and explores the emotional connection between people and lifelike machines. She studies what will soon be called human-robot relationships. She receives degrees in economics and law from the University of Basel, and after a 2014 PhD titled Copyright and New Technologies at ETH Zurich, Dr. Darling returned to the US to teach a robot ethics course at Harvard Law School. She is a former fellow at the Harvard Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society, the Yale Information Society Project, and is an affiliate at the Institute for Ethics and Emerging Technologies. She's got an honorary doctorate of sciences from Middlebury College, and her work has been featured in Vogue, The New Yorker, The Guardian, BBC, NPR, Forbes, Wired, The Atlantic, Die Zeit, The Japan Times, and so much more. Dr. Darling's first book, The New Breed, What Our History with Animals Reveals About Our Future with Robots, is hitting shelves on April 20th, 2021. This was a really interesting interview where we got to talk a lot about the way in which we will interact with, with robots in the future. Um, some good and some of the things that we need to really watch out for. So give it a listen. Let us know what you think. Get uh, Dr. Darling's new book, The New Breed. Um, and we look forward to hearing whether you are going to have a new breed of robot in your house. Hi, Kate. Thanks so much for joining me today. It's wonderful to chat with you. Thanks for having me. Absolutely. So my favorite thing to do with people when we start is, especially when you have really complicated jobs and PhDs and everything else, um, to say in one line, what exactly is it that you do? One line. Okay. So I study human robot interaction from a social, legal, and ethical perspective. Does that fit on the line? I think so. That fits on one line. All right. So uh, explain to me a little bit about that. Like, because you started out with economics and law, and then you moved over to the robot side of things, applying it there. So how did you get on this path? Like, what made you make that jump? I know it, it seems kind of weird, <laughs> econ and law, robots, but I think the what has always fascinated me is how systems shape human behavior. And so law and economics are definitely systems that shape human behavior, but so is technology. Hmm. And then just to be honest, I've always loved robots. And so the fact that I I somehow managed to create a job for myself where I could use my background in social sciences and play with robots all day is just a dream come true. <laughs> That's funny. Do you actually, do you remember the first robot that you ever met? Met? Probably, that probably depends on how you define robot. I definitely have like the robot that made the biggest impression on me and that kind of kickstarted my career shift to yeah. robotics was this baby dinosaur robot called a Pleo. It was this toy that I bought in 2007 when it came out. And it was this baby dinosaur robot that could move and mimic kind of emotions and, and um, it's just very cute. And I bought it because I was fascinated by it. Technically it cost $500, which at the time for a toy, it was like, wow. And it had all these motors and touch sensors and infrared cameras. Uh, but then it could mimic pain really well. And when I showed it off to my friends, I would have them hold it up by the tail because if you hold it up by the tail, it'll start to cry. And then at some point I realized that it was bothering me when they did that. And I would tell them to put it back down. And that was just really weird because I knew how it worked, but I still was had had these feelings, these, this empathy for it. And that made me start thinking more about, oh, what does it mean that we have these lifelike machines that are coming into our lives and increasingly coming into our shared spaces and they can mimic these cues that we respond to, even though we know that they're fake. Um, and so that started my whole interest in human robot interaction. Very cool. Yeah, I mean, I can't imagine it, right? Like, I, I've got a five month old and when he cries, like there's like, like the hair stands up on the back of your neck and you're like, oh my God, like, right. And so uh, a 
uh, a robot or like an AI toy that can mimic that and like elicit that same exact response? It's got to be like, you know, is that the future? Is that where we're going? Well, I mean, the future is in some ways up to us. We can decide how to design these machines. Um, but we are starting to see that it's pretty easy to get people to treat robots like they're alive. Mm. Um, it doesn't take a lot to, people will treat their Roomba like it, they'll, they'll name their Roomba, they'll feel bad for it when it gets stuck. So if they do that with even a disc, then you can imagine robots that are designed by, you know, Pixar animators or people who really know how to create emotionally compelling characters. And we respond to that, we respond to it. And, and like you said, it's like, it's on a deeper biological level that's not just us being unfamiliar with this technology. It's the same way that we respond to animals and other non-humans. We, we project human emotions onto them. We love, we're such social creatures that we love to respond to social cues. And we also respond to the physical movement that robots have because our brains are so hardwired to separate things into objects and agents in our environment. And now we have these objects that move like agents and we automatically just subconsciously treat them like they have intent in their movement and that they're like, they have human emotions or animal like emotions. And yeah, I, th I think that that is the future, whether it's a good or a bad thing or how we should design it is a, there's a lot of questions that are up to us. That's so funny. I mean, like I have definitely apologized to my Roomba after I've locked it in the bathroom before right, by accident. Um, and so like, I totally know what you mean. But like this idea of like an object that moves like human like, you know, is this what you mean when you talk about life like machines that you do in your writing and, and a lot of your speaking engagements and, and now in your new book? Um, you know, is this what you're talking about? The life likeness of them? Yeah, and it's something that can be designed intentionally, like the Plio, and it's something that can happen unintentionally, like the Roomba, just because it's moving around in your space on its own, might cause you to apologize to it or you know treat it like a little little bit like you would treat a pet. Um, and so yes, it it we we are seeing increasingly lifelike machines, um, whether they're intentionally designed to be that way or not. That's how we perceive them. And now that robots are moving from being kind of in factories and behind cages and walls and coming into workplaces, households, public spaces, I think we're going to see a lot more responses like that to them where we're treating them differently than toasters. Yeah, <laughs> you know, I think that that's like, a, it seems like it's a great distinction to make from like a lifelikeness perspective because robots could be everything from like, you know, on the manufacturing line, like stapling a car together through to the autonomous vehicle that's like driving you around now. But there's an immense difference between, you know, a, a, you know, a lifelike companion robot and a robot that's like sitting on an assembly line, for example. Totally. And so part of what my book is about is making a comparison to animals because I feel like those are the other non-humans that we've dealt with where we treat a lot of them like tools and products and some of them like our companions. So we've made the same types of distinctions that I think we're gonna start seeing with robots as well. It's really interesting because this idea of, you know, like applying our emotions to animals are something that we've become like so familiar with or like that we do really naturally right like you know my dog like I think that he's sad and hungry and you know these things that he actually like has feelings about and like he knows but then I also like apply other feelings to him like oh I know that he like really loves my baby right like and he protects my baby and he probably doesn't right like that's probably me projecting onto him but as we, we start to see some more of these like companion robots, I think like at CES, there was this one Mofflin, like how freaking cute was that thing? You, like, you know, like, did you see it? The little tiny fuzz Oh, the, the, the fuzzy one? Yes, that, oh, that one looks really cute. So adorable. Um, but you know, as they have these personalities that we program into them and this range of emotions, you know, do you think that they're gonna become even more companion-like than our pets are because they're actually built to replicate us and our feelings as opposed to an animal that does like, in some ways have its own? Well, I mean, that's to me still an open question. Do we really, 
are we really trying to recreate ourselves and human emotion and human intelligence? And I would actually argue that that's quite limiting and boring. <laughs> yeah. well, what we can create is something new. That's why the, the book I wrote is called The New Breed. Um, we have this new relationship that we can create. We can design it to be what we want. It doesn't make sense. And, and, and we're not capable currently of recreating human intelligence or human skill, especially not social skills. I mean, these machines <laughs> perceive the world very differently than we do. Um, so I would argue that we shouldn't even be trying to go in that direction, but rather should be thinking about this as a supplement, the same, the same way, like, it's not gonna be like an animal. There's lots of differences between animals and robots. Like an animal can't, you know, yeah. you can't dictate an email to an animal. And at the same time, animals are better at like navigating physical spaces than robots are. So there's a lot of differences, but in the same ways that animals have kind of supplemented our social relationships instead of replacing them, I feel like that's how we should be building social robots as well. And really trying to lean into how can we partner with these technologies? How can they be beneficial to our goals rather than trying to recreate ourselves? That's a really interesting idea. So like, how can they be more beneficial to us than even just a pet companion that, you know, does have their own goals and objectives at the end of the day, right? You know, do you think that there's also the opportunity that robots could teach us something, right? Like if I think about my Alexa or my Google Home, right? Like I ask them things all day long, like they teach me what the weather is outside before I open the door. Um, but is there like a bigger, like a more compelling case for that? There are certainly a lot of different use cases. Oh my gosh, Alexa, you were saying that. I just remembered that the other day, Alexa told me that the animals in the zoos were sad because no one could visit them because it's the pandemic. It's like, I didn't need to know that, Alexa. That just made me sad. <laughs> but let Amazon program that in is a better question. <laughs> oh. But, um, but as for like what we could use robots for, we already are seeing some pretty compelling use cases in health and education, for example. So there's this research that has been going on for over a decade now. Um, uh, I'm not involved in this, but some of my colleagues do research with children on the autism spectrum. And it turns out that robots are this new uh, interesting tool that can engage kids in new types of therapies in ways that we haven't been able to previously, in ways that we haven't been able to with animals or with people, because the robots occupy this interesting space where the kids treat them like social agents, but they also know that they don't come with the baggage of people. Um, and you can get the robot to talk, like an animal can't talk or yeah. you know, practice social skills with them in the same way. So it's a new tool. And there's other applications, there's using robots um, therapeutically as animal therapy replacements that are soothing for dementia patients. Yeah. And there's, you know, and at the same time, there's also a lot of ways that you could use robots that maybe aren't that, you know, beneficial for the social good. You could have, you know, unlike animals, robots can record everything that you're saying and record your conversations. and. Um, you were saying that animals sometimes have their own agendas. Well, the people who create the robots could sometimes have their own agendas as well. And that's even more hidden and behind the scenes. So there are that also some is, questionable use cases. That is such a great point, right? Is that, you know, just like whoever was that person at Amazon who decided to tell you that the zoo animals are sad, right? Like there is like kind of like, you know, the man behind the creation of all of these different tools. Um, you know, like with you, you've you've actually created Mr. Spaghetti, right? Um, I didn't create Mr. Spaghetti. Mr. Spaghetti is a is a robot I bought. Okay, so you bought Mr. Spaghetti, um, and those robots that you are using, you know, like do you have any qualms having them be part of like your family, be interactive with your kids, and and listening to everything that you guys are doing on a daily basis in order to like you know decipher the world around them? You know, I, I have very mixed feelings about all of the robots we have in our home, because like you said, a lot of them do have the capability to collect information and then it's stored somewhere in the cloud and co the companies do have access to it. And I feel like I have to kind of have these technologies because I can't speak about them if I'm not engaging with them. Um, but yeah, I think the way that I 
try to handle it. My, my kid's only three, but as he gets older, we're going to try to teach him more about what is actually happening in these robots and teach him more about what AI is capable of, what you know these microphones and cameras mean, what happens to the data, um, just so that he's he grows up tech literate in this world. Um, I think that's one small thing that we're going to try to do. Yeah, for that's such a great point. Like we, I don't know if we've ever talked about that like ex exclusively in our house, but you know, like our daughter who also is three, her house talks to her right? Like she's never lived in a world where like your house couldn't respond to you. She walks into a room and she says, you know, like, okay, Google turn on the lights in Nora's room and the lights in Nora's room turn on. Right. Um, and so she knows how to like interact with her house and inanimate objects around her. And one of the big things that we have been super conscientious about is making sure that she uh, speaks to them and interacts with them politely and still assigns a measure of respect to them. Um, because that's one of the big things that we noticed from the onset is the way that we spoke to the house, right, was the way that she would mimic. And we suddenly realized, like, it's not okay for it to be, like, so directive and so, like, impolite all the time. And so, like, to build in niceties. And so, like, Google thanks me all the time for how polite I am. But it, I, I wonder, like, how important is it to, like, model this ethical behavior with inanimate robotics well i mean the an the scientific answer is we don't know how important it is because we don't have enough research on how these systems actually change people's behavior what we do have is a little bit of research showing that the way people treat life like robots tends to be tends to reflect their general senses for empathy or how social they are um, but we don't know if it has an impact on kids, like if kids get used to barking commands at Alexa or the Google Home, are they gonna bark commands at people? But there's enough concern about it, especially among parents like yourself, like you are not alone. So many parents complained to these companies that I think both both Amazon and Google have released, I don't know if you know the, the add-on features that you can turn on where they make you say please and thank you <laughs> and won't follow the command. I think it's called, like Amazon calls it the magic word feature or something. So just, there's enough, people are starting to realize as we interact with these devices and as they get better at mimicking actual human social conversations um, or mimicking life in general that, you know, oh, maybe it's not okay to kick the robot even if it can't feel anything because that feels wrong and maybe that's muddled in my subconscious um, and, and could make my kid more likely to kick a real dog or an animal or another kid. So there are some questions that we don't have answers to, but there's, they're worth asking. So the question is, are we going to raise a bunch of sociopaths if we continue to talk to our inanimate objects um, so poorly? Do you think that, you know, like, well, we talk about people having empathy with these lifelike robots. Do you think that robots will ever fully understand what humans go through, right? Like a midlife crisis, PMS, grief, you know, excitement. How, how well are they going to actually be able to interpret our emotions um, in, in your opinion? That's a great question. Like, I, I mean, if you're talking about the endless future, I, I never say never, yeah. but I think, you know, for the near term future, and this is why I like the animal comparison so much. It's kind of like asking the question, you know, does your dog understand when you're upset? Dogs can pick up on you being upset. Um, they understand some piece of that, but they probably don't understand the full range of human emotions that you're experiencing. And probably the same is gonna be true for quite some time for robots and AI where they can pick up on cues, they can respond to cues, they can mimic things, um, but they, won't understand the world or feel the world the way a human does. Gotcha. And so, you know, from our perspective, right? Like we look at, uh, at all different types of businesses that leverage visual data, right? So a lot of times they're leverage, they're using computer vision, machine learning, AI in order to understand things like video, photo, LiDAR, radar, et cetera. You know, in this idea of like creating uh, lifelike devices that actually can at least recognize when we are upset or excited. How important is it to have a visual tech feature built in like these cameras in order to 
facial recognition and understanding. What do you mean by how important? Because <laughs> there are different ways that you can measure emotion and I think you can, you know, look for um, affect in people's voices. You can look for body language through cameras. Um, but there's also a lot of problems with these technologies in that the people building them often build in a lot of our human and cultural biases. And, you know, there's a lot of people doing work on bias in artificial intelligence right now and some of the huge problems that we're already seeing in facial recognition yeah. uh, where these systems are trained on mostly white faces and then can't identify black faces for example um so there's a lot of problems with that so i, I don't know what importance I mean it, kind of, it depends on what you're trying to do with the technology and the most important thing is to understand the limitations of the technology rather than just believing that, you know, we can do anything with AI or we should do anything with AI just because we should, we can doesn't mean we should necessarily either. Absolutely. You know, like we've had um, Timnit Gebru on here who, um, you know, has had, was at Google and leading their ethics and AI group. Um, and so talking a lot about the way in which uh, computer vision and facial recognition and all of these things are are um, integrating the bias of society today into the world of tomorrow is one of the big things that like we think about and figure out ways which we can improve it right and go around it and so you know the way that we see it though is that only only through cameras and video and things like this are we ever going to be able to uh, diversify our data set, right? Um, that's actually being analyzed and, and things like this. And so, you know, installing a camera onto nearly every robot that's going to be existing in our house, you know, we think it's just a matter of time before it happens. Whether that's good or bad is, you know, still up in the air, as you said. <laughs> But all these virtual assistants, you know, they keep learning from us. And so in order to, to try to let them read our thoughts or predict our requests, you know, we're at least of the opinion that they need to be able to see us in the same way that like, you know, I can see your reaction to the things that I'm saying and process it in order to like make a better, better question or a better response, right? Um, do you kind of see it the same way? I mean, I do see that there's a lot of incentive to push in that direction. And beca because the functionality of these machines often relies directly on being able to collect that data. So of course, yes, like all of industry and all of the world is moving towards trying to collect as much data as possible. Um, but yeah, I think the work of Tim and Gabriel and, and Joy Bolamwini, they wrote you know, this seminal paper, Gender Shades, uh, calling out some of the huge problems that exist in facial recognition technologies. And they ended up forcing companies to actually have to rethink and change some of their processes. So I guess my question is, if there's so much incentive to collect all of this data mm. and not a lot of incentive to protect people's privacy or you know, think about these bias issues, um, and those harms are kind of, less visible to us than the immediate functionality that we get from the robot. How are we as a society going to push for companies to be truly responsible and, and think very carefully about how they're developing these technologies um, and, and about whether that's the right direction to go in. So I'm so grateful that there are people like Joy and Timnit out there. And I'm so sad that Timnit got fired from Google because they need people like her. Absolutely. You know, there's uh, this whole idea of like auditing AI is like this big concept now that we're super interested in, 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 in order to, um, you know, better everything that we're developing now to ensure that the structural inequalities of today aren't impacting the ones of tomorrow. Um, and, you know, like, I think that that even goes towards the way that we, we treat our Roombas and stuff as we've been talking about and like, building new relationships with robots. And so in the new breed, you mentioned this idea of like diverse kinds of relationships, right? Can you shed some light on that topic? Like how you're thinking about it? I know we've talked about it a little bit, but like, you know, what's, what's the key point behind that that you want people to take away from your book? Well, I think when I think about our conversations about 
robots and AI, especially on a social level. Um, we're often talking about robots as human replacements, whether that's in our science fiction stories, like robots replacing our romantic partners or sexual partners, whether that's in our backyard conversations. Um, often working in social robotics is interesting because the first question that you know, our roboticists often get is, oh, is this meant to replace a teacher or replace a caretaker or replace a human? But really, I think that that's a little bit of a red herring because not only are robots terrible human replacements <laughs> and will be for a long time, that's also not how we should be building them. And that's not what we should be aiming for. And I think that the animal example is great because it shows how social we are as creatures and how diverse the relationships are that we can create and how those relationships can supplement each other. Like people aren't worried about you being antisocial because you have a dog at home, right? Like we, we are somehow very accepting of the idea that we can partner with animals and humans and that doesn't take away from each other. And I think robots can fit into that pretty seamlessly as well. Um, we do need to be responsible about how we design them. Mm -hmm. um, and that is, that is, I think, what we should be focusing on instead of this question of, are they going to replace us? I don't think that's what we should be thinking about. Okay, so then if you had if you had input on how these robots were designed in order to make them better and to help augment us or improve humanity as we go forward, what are you know like three things that you would absolutely ensure are a part of every robot that's developed from here on out? It's a tough question. <laughs> it is a tough question because like there's such a range of what robots can be used for. And it kind of, it depends on the use case. Like there's some ca use cases where like, I wouldn't want the robot to act social. There are some use cases where I would want the robot to act social, but not look like a human. Then well, there's like- art Give me an example energy. on that one, right? Like, so what's an example of a robot that you wouldn't want to be social? If a robot is supposed to function as a tool mm -hmm. and you have people relating to it on an emotional level. Um, and th like that can be anything from inefficient to dangerous. Um, it also sometimes creating um, social aspects in robots causes people to trust them or assume that they can do certain things. And if the robot is basically just a glorified calculator, you don't want that mismatch in assumption and what the robot's actually there for. So tool robots should be tools and social robots should be social. And then there's a whole in-between phase where you can use social aspects or where people are gonna treat it like a social device no matter what you do. But um, I do think there are cases where it, 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 just, it depends on what you're trying to do. And I think that we're not quite aware enough yet of how differently people treat robots than other devices and how much we need to design while taking that into account. Interesting. Right, so basically like, my vacuum. I should not be assigning social <laughs> social cues to. I won't yeah, apologize, one, Roomba. That again. one I don't mind. <laughs> that one I don't mind. Okay, here's an example. They have these grocery store robots uh, on the East Coast. I don't know if they have them where you're based in New York, but we have Stop and Shops here, and they have this robot named Marty. And Marty looks like a giant penis, um, and <laughs> like it's like six feet tall and roams around the store. Has this huge base, and so one of the students that I work with at MIT, Daniela Di Paola, she noticed that everyone hates this robot. She noticed all of her friends and family are like, oh, these robots are in the way and I hate it. <laughs> and she did this sentiment analysis on Twitter where she was looking at spikes in negative or positive mentions of Marty. And she found the most negative mentions of this robot happened when Stop and Shop celebrated the robot's birthday with like free cake and balloons when they made a big deal about it being like you know social yeah. or human and and so there are cases where it <laughs> where if you make the robot look social they put googly eyes on it so it, it like has a face and stuff but then people are annoyed that it's in their way they're like why can't it see me why can't it move um, so yeah. you have to be careful if it looked more like a machine, then maybe people wouldn't be quite as annoyed by it, but because they're expecting it to behave better because it look, it has a face. 
Um, so that's one example of just trying to be aware of the use case. <laughs> the, the giant penis that tracks you as you move down the aisle with its googly eyes. <laughs> that's great. You know, I heard like a similar story about, um, I forget the name of the robot, but it was being used in hotels in order to like help with room service or like bring things up. So if you forgot your toothbrush, you'd call down to, to the desk and they'd send a toothbrush up with the robot. But the initial version of it had like two eyes and a smiley face on just like a screen. Um, and it freaked everybody out. Like everyone was like, I don't want to get in the elevator with this thing. Like this like random thing showed up at my door, like this giant smiley face that like, but it couldn't actually talk to you or interact or anything like this. And so the company took the face off of the robot and now it's much more successful because people aren't as freaked out by it. Um, and so it's such, it's such an interesting thing, right? Like, when should we like humanize and make social and when should we like maintain that they're a tool still treat them with respect obviously in the same way that we like treat our chairs and tables and hammers and things like that with respect um but not necessarily assign like the human attributes to them it's such an interesting time that we live in because the robots are coming into these shared spaces and so now we're seeing the growing pains. Now we're seeing all the mistakes happen and, and seeing the industry learn from their mistakes. And it's just, it's fascinating. Yeah. Um, so, you know, like, obviously you thought about all of us really uh, a lot as you're putting your book together. And, you know, if there was one thing that you really want people to take away from your book, what would it be? Or, you know, like, let's say, let me give you an exact example of somebody who's reading your book. What if it was for the person who's developing the next inventory robot for the grocery store? What would you want their one takeaway to be? That I, I would want them, because this is, this is something that people in robotics do all the time too, I would want them to think carefully about whether they are subconsciously trying to recreate a human task and whether if they think outside of the box, they can actually create something better. Interesting. You know, it's one of the things that we've actually talked about a lot. We um, have looked, we look at a lot of robotics companies, obviously, because robot robots typically need to be able to see in order to grab and, and do other things too. And we've got a company like Buoyant Photonics, it's LiDAR on a chip. So we think that like LiDAR is going to be like on, you know, the fingertips of of robots in the future in order to help them grab and like understand the dimensions of objects, um, things like that. But this idea that like the hand is the best tool for everything <laughs> we do is totally false, right? Like when we start to think about it, like why develop a robot with hands if hands can't like reach that thing that fell behind the desk or it can't, you know, like automatically screw that piece back onto that machinery or whatever it is. And so it's so important to think about like what what is the best way to go about this and like think outside of, you know, the human form maybe. Yeah, people sometimes people argue, oh, robots have to look like humans because we have a world built for humans and so we have, you know, stairs and narrow passageways and things that they have to grab. But I think that that's too nearsighted as well, because if you think about building a world that's wheelchair accessible, for example, now suddenly you've, you know, killed two birds with one stone. Yeah. This is something that Laurel Reek once said to me, she's a roboticist at UC San Diego. And she was like, well, if we designed for wheelchairs, then you could have much cheaper uh, robots with a wider range of abilities and you would make the world more accessible for people. So thinking outside the box is important on every level in, in technology development. For sure. Did you see, uh, I mean, I, I think everybody saw Boston Dynamics Christmas party. The dancing. The dancing. I mean, it was, it was great, right, to see uh, this idea that like, you know, it brought some human-like or personality to a bunch of robots that don't look like us. They're not, you know, like they're, they're generated to kind of act like us in some ways in the way that they walk and things like that, but are in this whole idea trying to be better than humans while existing in our world and make it a better world. And so it it's really interesting. And that's, that's what that makes me think of in a lot of ways. Um, cool, so last question for you before I, I give you back some time in your day is um, if computers, robots or AI didn't exist, what do you think your career choice would have been? That's a really good question. <laughs> 
You know, I originally went to law school because I wanted to be a criminal defense attorney. Um, so maybe, maybe that's what would have happened. <laughs> Hard to know. Careers, careers are weird things. They are indeed. They can lead you from economics and law over to robotics. <laughs> Um, well, Kate, it's fantastic talking to you. Really excited to read The New Breed when it comes out in April. Um, we'll, we'll keep in touch and hopefully, you know, we can work together and continue to collaborate in the future. Great. Thank you so much, Abby. All right. Thank you.